The Lal Street ends higher for the second week in a row. The Nifty and the Sensex rise 1% this week. Mid-caps outperform. This week, we take stock of the big block deal seen on the Lal Street. We put the spotlight on India's jewellery sector and we'll decode the market action. Hello and welcome to another edition of Editor's Roundtable. I'm Reema Tindulkar. With me, we've got Nimesh Mangalam and we've got Mihir Vora with us in the newsroom. Hi, boys. Yep. Hello. 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 How do you feel this Friday afternoon? <laughs> we, you feel tired after running on a treadmill. That's exactly how you feel. Why is that? Because yes, you've run, but you haven't gotten you anywhere. Yeah. So that's exactly what happened in the markets as well. So much happened and yet we're up by just 1% for the entire week. A lot of stocks moved. A lot of stocks moved in either direction. A lot of yeah. buyers, a lot of sellers. So much happened and still we are here on a Friday. <laughs> but not a bad outcome. You know, honestly, not a bad outcome. Not a, not a, given the fact that we've rallied pretty hard, uh, we've been outperforming. Uh, this week saw some bit of jitters from the global markets as well, at least towards the end of the week. But still we managed to you know, hold on. The fact is, even our, if you look at our internal data, the PCR is at almost 1.4, which is not a healthy sign. 14, 15 stocks are in FNO band. Yep. And you know, large blocks were 20,000 crores. Yep. And still we are up 1%. So I, I would read it that way, that the momentum still seems to be with the bulls. Yep. Uh, despite so much of supply coming in, we are, we, we are marching ahead. And, uh, and the fact is that we're ignoring a lot of, lot of uh, global as well as local news. So I guess a bit of complacency now in the market. One needs to be uh, watchful. But uh, the moment, I mean, it's, it's basically a liquidity market. So you can't complain. So even after absorbing this kind of supply, the Nifty is up 1% this week. The mid-cap index is up 1.5%. And the small cap index has a gain of close to about 3%. Uh, Mihir, you're also surprised, right? We've seen flows of 5,000 crore of cash in a single day. That happened on Thursday, both the FIs and DIs purchased, but the markets have not moved up. Absolutely. Um, which also shows that, you know, there is supply coming in at higher levels. Yeah. Uh, and it's no surprise, we have a host of IPOs, we have QIVs uh, almost every day of a couple of companies, you have PE funds uh, selling, you have promoter blocks uh, being offered for sale. So I think. At a price, supply uh, does tend to respond to demand, you know. And this week it's accelerated yeah. a bit. But you know, I just want to put on board the HSBC note, Nimesh, that you Absolutely. were highlighting earlier. And this is, they say that Indian equities are hot, undoubtedly. Yeah. Uh, but after 13 of, uh, out of the 15 years of gains and trading at lofty valuations, they're asking the question, what can go wrong? So they've identified 10 risks which on their own do not possess, pose any kind of an immediate threat, but in aggregate, it could derail the rally. Right. So they continue to stay overweight on the Indian equity markets. They're acknowledging the risks in the Indian market and the 10 risks that they've highlighted. One, the stress for banks is increasing. Two, uh, banks are struggling to grow deposits. Private sector capex is sluggish. There is weak and concentrated foreign investment. Unequal consumer growth, there are risks to earnings. Q1 earnings has been very, very muted. ESG and sudden changes in the regulations. Uh, Mihir, put all this together. Do you think a correction is coming? What's your own gut? Uh, price correction, I'm not too sure because I think nobody wants to call the top because of liquidity. Uh, you know, the kind of uh, mutual fund and insurance and NPS, etc. flows that, that are coming in. That financialization uh, theme continues to grow. Uh, but uh, yes, I would be worried on a couple of fronts. Uh, one is that we've just finished the earnings season now, more or less everything is out in terms of results. And uh, if you look at the top uh, 100, 200 companies aggregate, the numbers are not that great. You know, you've seen single digit earnings growth in the Nifty. Now you can slice and dice by saying metals, non metals, and all that. But the headline number is a single digit growth and almost 1% growth only on the Nifty earnings. And this is after a very probably after uh, three or four years that we've seen such a low YOI year-on-year -year growth on the Nifty earnings. So that's one. Uh, second is uh, the U.S. is slowing down. Uh, now, of course, the flip is that because the U.S. is going to slow down, we're going to see rate cuts, so you can be happy about it. But the fact is that the U.S. is slowing down and the largest economy in the world is not doing that great. China and has not been, it's been struggling uh, for a while now. Uh, so we do have global headwinds. Uh, coming in and uh, with uh, uh, the large cap earnings at least not looking that great, uh, it's time to be a little more choosy if not cautious. So how are you uh, choosing your, uh, your your stocks in the portfolio because you've just recently launched a multi-cap fund as well. Uh, I spoke to a lot of investors including you at the couple of conferences and everybody seems to be a bit cautioned, right? And normally uh, market doesn't favor the, uh, the consensus. So in that sense, how are you looking to position your, your portfolio? So I, I read a WhatsApp forward uh, somewhere, you know, that uh, uh, fund managers are worried, advisors are cautious, 
but retail investors are, are optimistic. optimistic. You know, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's what it looks like uh, currently. So what I mean, it's only been four months since we launched our fund, yeah. so not great in terms of churn. But actually, uh, in the in, in the initial portfolio, we used to probably have a lot more industrials. Mm -hmm. Just four months ago, we were very overweight on industrials yeah. and the growth names like Defence, uh, all those themes. Uh, but fortunately, uh, they ran up very sharply. Yeah. Probably aided by some of the large NFOs, NFOs in the yeah. manufacturing space, defense. So sh stocks rallied, and actually we started trimming also. Okay. So four months is really a short time to really trim your position, but the the gains were so high that we actually uh, trimmed positions in the industrial so space made, and going uh, more into some of the capital market links themes, uh, yeah. the pharma plays, etc. So, Mir, is this going to be the the trick now that as fund managers you have to be very aggressive, uh, buying also and selling also, and like churning the portfolio uh, every now and then is going to be the key mantra. To, to have an alpha? Uh, see, active, I, I wouldn't call it churn, I would call it active management. Right, sure. And for us, the churn or the buying or selling decisions come because of either price movements Absolutely. or change in fundamentals, right. right? If everything else remains same, there's been no earnings upgrade and the stock is up by 50%, then probably you want to sell it, right? right? So, you know, on, on these uh, fundamental related versus price movement itself, there are so many confounding cues. When you started out, you said that U.S. is slowing down, but now the belief is that maybe, you know, because U.S. is slowing down, the Fed's, uh, Fed will cut rates and that will be positive for us because that will infuse more liquidity. Similar is the case for promoter selling as well, right? One looks at promoter selling as a sign that the promoter is exiting, but a lot of them look at it as increase in free float and thereby perhaps an increase in MSCI weightage and therefore there would be some more f funds coming in. So it's, it's that market where everything is justified to one's original benefit. How does one then maintain their rationality in a situation like that? Absolutely. So, you, you, you ultimately, you, you got to stick to the netting, which is yeah. study the valuations, study the growth prospects, take a bigger picture view and, and act. So, uh, so as I said, I, I, I typically is... would not like to churn a stock in four months, but if a stock is up 60% and nothing has changed, then probably you want to trim it, right? So that's how we work. Okay, uh, hold that thought because we want to get your thought in also on the jewellery space. Manglam, you've done some analysis and this week we had big moves in Kalyan Jewelers. Exactly, you know, we were talking about the promoter's stake, uh, selling, etc. This was the first time that a PE, uh, you know, sold and the promoter bought in a very long time and that explained why the stock moved higher. So I thought, let's lose that, use that as a peg to try and understand what's happening in the jewellery sector itself. So, the jewellery sector in India, of course, is, you know, comprising of a lot of the lead, uh, a lot of the others and the leader itself. The leader is Titan, we are talking about that and we're talking about how the others have panned. So if you look at, you know, Titan's stock price move over the last six months, it's actually negative versus Kalyan Jewelers at 57%, Senko at 36% as well. Last one year, Titan's up 17%, Kalyan Jewelers up, uh, along with Senko, up nearly 160 to 170% as well. And you s expand the time horizon, two years, Titan's up 48%, Kalyan Jewelers is, is up 650%, and from its issue price, Senko Gold is up 250%. So it's over two years of underperformance from the leader. What exactly is happening? Well, if you look at the thesis of the industry, you know, not much has changed because the organized sector is still growing at two to two and a half times industry. But it's the disruptors, the newer players who are growing faster due to one lower base and getting access to a lot more capital by listing or raising funds, etc. Their store expansion through franchises and obviously the margins improving due to operating leverage as well. The product differentiation in jewellery between two brands has reduced because of BIS, competitive intensity, price parity. Everyone's margins have compressed and there was a huge valuation gap between Titan and the others. That has become narrow as well. So if you look at Titan's jewellery ma margins itself, over the last many quarters, it's come down from 14.4% to about 10%, talking about the intensity in competition in the market. And this, when the revenue growth has been similar to all the other players on the huge base as well. If you look at all the other players as well, where do they stand? Titan, for the last year, uh, trailing 12 months, revenues were close to around 44,000 crores, Kalyan closer 20,000 crores, Senko and Thangamail between 4 and 5,000 crores. But in margins, Titan is the clear leader at 11%, and which is why it gets the maximum market cap as well at 3,20,000 crores. And with the up move that we've seen, everyone else is at 61,000 61, crores and below. Titan has 490 stores, Kalyan 277, Senko and Thangamail between 59 and 65, 165. Kalyan has actually increased its stores by a fair amount as well. So what next will happen for the jewellery sector? There is improved consumer sentiment ahead of the festive season, the cut in the budget, store expansion in India and abroad would be the key trigger for every player. Design and brand positioning will be the key differentiators for Titan and the others. We need to watch out for the impact of lab-grown diamonds and how that plays out on margins. 
And then there are newer uh, formats like Carrot Lane for Titan, Candy Air for Kalyan, etc. Kalyan is looking to divest its non-core assets. Titan is looking to grow through new categories, balance sheet improvement for players like PC jewelers who have doubled in this year itself, and leadership transition for Titan sometime in the next year as well. Everything has a price. So let's look at it. Two years ago, Titan was trading at 64 times, Kalyan 19 times, and Senko 13 times. Two years later, after the underperformance, Titan is at 60 times, Kalyan is at 50 times, Senko at 29 times. So I guess what I'm saying is that the valuation differential has narrowed quite a bit. With this underperformance, is it time now for the street to remember the Titan? <laughs> Okay, interesting uh, data that you've compiled there over Man uh, Mangalam. Uh, Mihir, do, are you bullish on the jewellery stocks? Uh, gold prices have inched up. Then there is that budget push with the customs duty cut. Uh, consumers are lapping up. Uh, there is so much money to spend, right? It's going in real estate, it's going in stocks, and it's also going in jewellery. But he's put up a comparison. You know, the most interesting data from Mangalam's yeah. uh, uh, you know, piece was that... Uh, Titan's, uh, Titan's uh, you know, valuations is at 60 times now, whereas the others have caught up very sharply in the last two years. Now, Kalyan is quoting at 60 times and Chesenko is around 40 odd times. So, what would you prefer in the in that in the jewelry space in case you have to buy something in that space? Will you, will you stick with the leader? Uh, so, a couple of things from the data that uh, Mangalam uh, presented. One is that it is a growth sector. Yeah. Right? So, everybody is growing. It's not like one is growing at the expense of others. There is, as you rightly said, there is enough the market is, is big enough and growing at a reason. It's a recession-proof industry. That's why it's always traded at a very high premium because there's a lot of visibility of the top line. Uh, but now I think the industry has come to a certain size that there is space for more people, right? So the shift basically is not uh, from one organized person to the yeah, another. It's from unorganized, it's from the unorganized to organized. Yeah. And I think that will continue. Sure. So there is space for, uh, you know, a lot of large players. That is one. And second is uh, there is a difference in business models that the different companies are following. So there is a differentiation in terms of business model. While everybody is doing jewellery, everybody is doing studded versus gold, etc. Uh, there are certain differences in the way some companies are handling their franchises, some companies are uh, owning their own shop. So I think that's also reflecting some of the valuations. Uh, if you, if you, as you, as you rightly pointed, the market is rewarding higher growth. So the the different the the narrowing of the uh, uh, Premium. premiums yeah. is because of the differential in uh, growth rate. I would sure. say. So do you have any jewelry stocks in uh, yes, your portfolio? Yes, we do. We do. I'm, I'm positive on the sector. Oh, you're what positive. About, mm. Sorry. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what about on the other consumer uh, sectors? Are you bullish on any part of the consumer discretionary or consumer staples uh, uh, segment? So we have selected uh, uh, names. No, we actually have very few of the large cap uh, FMC stocks, frankly. Okay. Whatever we have in FMC are very niche companies, you know, uh, which are... What is niche? Uh, niche in the sense, for example, some snacking company, okay. that company, some of the companies which supply to, say, kids, etc. So, which are in segments which still have a long runway of growth, which is in line with our philosophy, that it should be a fast-growing uh, sector or a fast-growing company with a long runway of growth. Speaking so, of fast-growing companies, I just wanted your thoughts on Zomato and all the other platform companies. I mean, it's... it's moved nearly five or six times uh, from its recent lows itself and now it's acquiring newer companies, it's acquiring newer platforms. Uh, District itself could be a next 20, 22,000 crore opportunity for them in terms of valuation addition. What are your thoughts on Zomato? So we've always been positive on platform companies, you know, uh, and as we in doing the NFO also, we, this was one of the themes that we are pursuing apart from the consumption and the financialization theme, infra theme, etc. Uh, essentially, you know, these are segments which are going to become Oligopolies. Okay. You know, it's it is a winner take all kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. So you'll have two or three or four players in each segment, and the total addressable market is anyway large. Plus, companies are going into adjacencies, so they can expand the time, uh, you know, by going into a newer category, which is what we are seeing in a lot of these cases. So we structurally remain positive. Mir, uh, a word on the uh, luxury, you know, luxury brand plays. Uh, are you looking at that sector in a in a very strong way? You know, look at Ethos for for example this week. At a record high, promoters sold out and still, you know, the funds are looking to buy into stocks like Ethos. Uh, in that luxury brand play, anything that strikes to you, which is still uh, quoting at reasonable valuations? Uh, so, we, while we don't own any of those sure. uh, of this, but structurally, the scale shape is, is still there. Right. Right. So, you are seeing much, much more resilient uh, demand at the higher ends of all the, all the, all the, all the consumption items, frankly. Okay. So, I, I don't think that's a surprise. So, if... Uh, again, just taking a name here, Stanley Lifestyles is the other one which looks at a large total addressable market, which is the luxury furniture market. Again, the same thing that one would have looked at in the jewellery sector, say, 20 years ago, where a large parties is unorganized, there is one large organized player 
Do you think there is a case for uh, you know this shift here and underlying wealth creation? Not specifically this stock, but this sector. Yeah. Uh, only thing is, uh, we also you also need to consider the, the particular segment, uh, what the competition levels are. Hmm. So some of the segments are prone to national monopolies yeah. or oligopolies. Some of the segments are anyway so fragmented that it may not be possible to make abnormal margins for a long period of time. Right. So you need to analyze using that prism also. Um, here do stay on. We want to slip into a very short break, but we'll come back and talk about the mega block deal scene uh, in this week. Stay tuned.